Welcome to the Parker Avery Group's Talk Retail to Me podcast and new for 2023 video series. In each episode, our consulting professionals cover key retail and CPG topics and offer pragmatic insights that will add value to your operations and initiatives. In this episode of Talk Retail to Me, we have another transformation happy hour. Featuring Senior Director Deanna Emsley, along with Senior Managers Heidi Census and Rob Gentry, the trio of experts hosts a happy hour discussion about data governance and master data management. All resources discussed will be in the show notes and replays available in both audio and video formats. Enjoy this expert deep dive into the retail data management world. Good afternoon or evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us to our latest Talk Retail to Me Transformation Happy Hour here with the Parker Avery Group. We are so excited you're here. We appreciate your time on a Thursday before a, hopefully for many of you, a long holiday weekend, which we hope for you is a nice, safe one as well. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, some introductions on our side. I'm joined by two of my favorite colleagues from the Parker Avery Group, Heidi, who's waving. <laughs> Thanks, Heidi, and Rob. And I am Deanna, and we're really excited to spend some time with you, as I said, this afternoon. Some of us do have beverages. Feel free to come on stage with us at any point and show us what you're drinking. It is happy hour. Heidi's got water, it looks like. I can't really tell what that is. Chocolate milk. <laughs> Oh, ooh, I love chocolate milk. That's not a happy hour choice for me usually, but I do love chocolate milk. Well, let's talk about some of the ways we can make this super interactive today. First of all, you should see that there is a chat option for you. Please go ahead and use that chat to ask questions or just to comment. It doesn't have to be something that you want us to respond to. It might just be, hey, I just want to add to that conversation as well. At times, we might offer you a poll question. So keep that panel open on the right where you see the chat. There will also be polls over there at times. If you'd like to join us here on camera, that's called on stage on this platform, just let us know in chat and we'll invite you on stage with us and then everyone will get to see you on camera as well. This session is being recorded but attendees' information, your individual poll responses, any transcript of the chat will not be shared. So all of that will remain private. So don't be shy. And I think with that, we'll go ahead and kick it off. I think we have a first question here, a little bit of an icebreaker. And <laughs> hi, Phil. <laughs> Phil's promising us that he does want to come on stage. So we'll see maybe with this first icebreaker, that might be the way to get him here. How does everyone define master data management? If you want to go ahead and give us some of your thoughts. You came to a happy hour to talk about data management, master data management. You may have had different words for that. But what do you define that as? Love to have some of your initial thoughts there in the chat. Heidi or Rob, if you want to kind of give us some of your initial thoughts, how do you define master data management? What have you heard our clients mean when they use that phrase? It is really broad and it should be, as Kathleen mentioned, should be consistently formatted and stored somewhere in a database or table within your environment for you to be able to access it. Um, and so there's the word master, which means overarching then data, which is obviously the stuff you want to have in your reports and planning tools, allocation, replenishment, and then management is that consistency. Um, I don't know if you guys would like to add anything else to it, but I thought Kathleen brought up a really good point. No, I agree, I agree with what Heidi is saying. I think in terms of uh, master data management in general, it's, it's just getting to that consistency and having the ability to pull and make the data that you have as useful as possible. And when you have inconsistencies within that data, the data can sometimes mislead you and take you in directions um, that you didn't want to go because you don't, you're not getting the full picture. Right. Phil also added, all common data used across multiple platforms and end users. And I think that touches on something that often what I see happen is something that occurs to teams a little late in the game, that they, they maybe one pocket, I'm just going to use an example, often marketing has their data very well structured, very well organized, because the nature of the channels they use requires that. Um, but maybe the product development team isn't as ticked and tied. 
And now we want to go use AI to determine the best ways of getting certain products into certain customers' eyes. And I need data from both. And it's not consistent. It's not organized in the same way. It may not even be accessible in one place. So I think that notion of it being accessed across multiple teams, multiple end uses, multiple use cases, I think is really, really important. And, and I think it touches on, Heidi, what you talked about, about that concept of master. That word sometimes sounds quite technical. And this isn't a technical challenge only, anyway. It's never just a technical challenge. Yeah, it certainly involves a lot of discipline and then having, you know, the courage, <laughs> if you will, and the and the and the resourcing within your organization to ensure that these policies and procedures as part of a solid data governance strategy are followed, which leads to clean master data. All right. Well, maybe it's a good time for one of our first polls. If our poll master can throw up a first poll for us. Maybe Rob, if you want to walk the group through this one, I'll hand the baton to you. I see some people already starting to answer. Certainly. Thank you. Certainly. So in terms of data, you know, what is your most challenging data management issue? And we've got four different responses here. Uh, IT owns data management, so there's minimal business input. Uh, there's no clear ownership of data management, uh, no data management standards or governance, or we don't have the resources to clean up the data mess. So far, we have a winner, but it's close that there's no clear ownership of data management. And that's something we see in a lot of organizations. Um, and it's, it's again, not a, a, an insurmountable problem, but it does require some degree of dedication and uh, resourcing uh, to address the issue. Right. I mean, it, in a way, every one of these possible answers is true, right? That there was no right or wrong answer here. Every one of these is something I think we've seen or experienced ourselves. Uh, the Parker Avery team is made up of people that most often have come from industry. So when we talk about these kinds of issues, we're not talking about it just as consultants, we're talking about as people who dealt with it as business owners in retail as well. And I think we've all probably felt the pinch of every one of these symptoms. Uh, when it comes to that poll, one of the things is, okay, so we don't really have an ownership of it. Great. So what happens when you do define a steward and throw them into that role where they just, you know, they came from somewhere else in the company and to keep people from running around in the circles and figuring out what to do. We just wanted to provide a few examples of things to help people just get started. And so somebody sits down in the desk and one of the things, and this is related to the four W's that we normally talk about for other things is where is the data stored? In most companies, many companies with legacy systems, it's all over the place. It's spaghetti strings of things moving all over the place and duplications of data and concerns that the place I got it from may not be right. Second thing is, okay, so I found these, who starts it? So is it a merchant who sets up an item? Is it someone in PLM who sets up a tech pack? Who owns that data along the way? And then how is that data used? Is it in reports? Is it to make business decisions? Is it informational only? So that helps you determine how long you need to keep it. And why? Why is this data being used in its certain formats? One of the things we found out in some of our clients is that all of their reports have the same five KPIs on them. It's just a different format. Some want the KPIs across, some want them up and down. So to get that consistency, you'd also want to delve into the reasoning why the, the information is shared the way it is. So that's just a couple of things to keep in mind if you are starting to implement a data governance process when you're going with the steward concept. We're getting full. Okay, I will. Um, I was just trying to be welcome. I don't know that I have brilliant insights in this particular area. I do think one of the challenges around the lack of ownership and it bleeds into the standards piece is it's often siloed and that leads to other complications very frequently even duplicative master data being built in the silos because of it not being met i mean i think early on as you started to have you know to move into an omni-channel world a lot of the conflicts came from what was used for internal and then what was needed for external customers mm -hmm. and you would have internal standard abbreviations and things like that that wouldn't work for customer facing or 
weren't granular enough for what you needed for there. And that led to people building out their own instead of solving and putting in the right structure. And it leads to where then you have five different values that could represent the same thing across the company. Yeah. The omni-channel Very example true. is a really good reminder. It feels like a long time ago, but we still have clients that are new to omni-channel. It's new to, to truly channel wide using all stores in that way, for example. And that is one great example of what rears its ugly head every time. That It's not just item descriptions. It can also be, hey, the way that we package that product is intended not to go to an individual customer. It's intended to be touched first before an individual customer gets to it. And so now all of a sudden, pack sizes, et cetera, that are kind of built into the data structure, it's causing a problem with the use case as well and meeting customer needs. So yeah, that's a really great example. And it's good to see you, Phil. Good to see you. I wanna to touch a little bit more on, there's no clear ownership of data management since that answer seems to be our, our leader in the horse race and the poll. Why do we think that is? Why is there no clear ownership of data management? Heidi talked a little bit about how hard it is when you're asked to take that seat. It's, it's a thankless role, <laughs> for sure. You often are at the crossroads of some tricky politics, um, some tricky business and technical nuances that are are not always easy to untangle and understand and find a compromise for. So I think part of the reason we see there's no clear ownership of data management is first, there's not a common definition of what data management is. And second, it doesn't sound like a great role to raise your hand and want to be the owner of. So does anyone have any ideas about, or maybe an experience you can share with the group about what has made that a more attractive role or did it happen by committee or, anything that helped ease the taking of that ownership in your organization. And as always, Rob or Heidi, if you wanna give some examples of what you've seen work well. What I've noticed is that many of the applications within an organization typically are owned by one group or person within the organization. So again, you get those silos going on. And then because of the um, disparity between the applications in terms of newness and updates and things of that nature, you've got some applications that are legacy that can't do some of the attributing and, and additional things that you want to do with the data. So you do end up with some uh, data in silos uh, and being maintained across different applications because of um, you know, the system limitations. But again, you know, with it being owned by different people within the organization, that makes it difficult to create that single avenue of, of creating uh, good data governance and stewardship throughout the organization. It's really not the sexiest job to be a data steward. The ownership issue could come from as the political discussions of who owns it. Is it IT that owns it or is it the business that owns it? And they may be, both be pointing fingers at each other saying not it, but there can be both of the teams in the role where the business users are actually responsible for the content. For any field you have in any data system, it's a business person who should be defining that. How those abbreviations that were mentioned, any other standards could come from IT and through that data steward role to say, all right, you spelled blue wrong, you did not include two decimal places or whatever the way that you want to define things to be. Um, but it, it could be a joint venture. It's just a matter of making those decisions and politically going through the proper way to make and provide that ownership. And what, one thing I've seen recently work well was when cleaning up the data, this is often the way this is described, cleaning up the data was an obstacle to doing a, a really cool, truly transformational machine learning project. And so being the person that cleaned up the data and unlocked the value, allowed that project to proceed was a highly valued role, very visible role, highly valued role. Um, that person was given full authority and autonomy to do this as quickly and as thoroughly as they deemed necessary. And um, that worked well. <laughs> they certainly did. They, they made sweeping changes in ownership, in some cases in the technology that owned the de definitions in, in the sense of some tools that owned the data became the recipients 
of that data and we're no longer allowed to edit that data, even though previously both systems were allowed to edit. This person was able to make changes that would say things like, nope, actually tool X, you will not be editing that kind of data any further. And that doesn't mean you can't have a say in editing, but you can't do it in tool X anymore. That's one thing I've seen work. That's also often why I think we all three of us are seeing this conversation come up so frequently these days because the sexy stuff, I'll use Heidi's word, the sexy stuff like AI and ML and pretty much anything that has the words optimization or transformation attached to them, they need clean data. And clean data only comes out of a clear, structured, true data management philosophy, let alone tools and processes. And doing it once and get a cute little run out of the tool isn't good enough. That doesn't pay the bills. That does not unlock the value of that ROI the way it needs to. Go ahead, Heidi. I was just going to say that Kathleen brought up a really good point related to that, where a lot of us are thinking about the way the world was with legacy systems, with data silos. We also have to start thinking about the future with the new roles that are in organizations that use this data more scientifically, like a data scientist role where in order for them to fully do their function, they need the data to be as accurate as possible. If you don't have the right attributes, characteristics, or anything else associated with products, locations, vendors, that data scientist can only do what they can with the data that's available. We alluded to the fact that many of us are seasoned retail professionals where we're, we've seen and lived through the, the stuff that got us to where we are today and understand that. But there's also all the new associates coming into the organization who are more used to the digital age. They're more used to having things fast and correct. And my search engine shouldn't be a, a SQL call that's 42 characters long. I want to find stuff fast and make quick decisions. So we're being forced in some way based on the new folks that are coming onto the teams to be able to support them and their desire to be effective within their role. I think it's interesting too, if you're a data scientist, sometimes what we see is true confusion, not disrespectfully so, but true confusion about why, why is this so hard for everyone else in the business? Because a data scientist, to Kathleen's point and Heidi's point, naturally tends to assume that data is always kept clean and organized so that the good, good stuff can happen next. <laughs> that the idea we'd have to start with that it's uh, very foreign. And maybe that's uh, a, another uh, happy hour topic for another day is the generational clash behind that topic. We'll leave that on the table for today, though. Heidi, I'm going to ask you to walk the group through our umbrella picture, if you don't mind. I don't mind. One of the things that I learned in a class about organizational change, public speaking, all that kind of stuff, is that when we're having a conversation like this, if you're participating in it firsthand, you might remember five to 7% of the words you actually heard, but having a visual can help you remember and recall things. Even if you don't remember exactly what it was, you may be able to think to yourself, oh, it was on that picture with the umbrella, and then you can go find that asset wherever you happen to share it to be able to talk about what you heard before. So this is trying to help understand and shape data governance versus everything else. Um, data governance is really the overarching set of rules from which everybody else has to take their their guidance on what they're going to be doing within their respective parts of the organization. And there are several children to that. For example, data governance can impact how you structure your hierarchies. So if you think about, um, for example, tires, if you're in a tire business or if you're in an alcohol business, you need to think about What's the most important way for you to aggregate data to make the most sense and the best business decisions? So in alcohol, if you're thinking about wine, is it red versus white? Is it by brand? Is it by container where it's a bottle versus a box? In tires, it may be more important to think about who is the provider of the Goodyear or somebody else who provides the tire. So you need to think about structurally what's important for you. Also things like attributes. And that's also for products. It could be for locations. One of our clients who's in the military makes sure that they want to designate a site as being family friendly, or is it more of a mini mart kind of concept to try to help them make sure that they allocate the right product. One of the questions we often get regarding attributes is, let's say Rob 
is responsible for KitchenAid mixers and other kitchen appliances, and Deanna is responsible for apparel. There are certain things where they're saying, I'm so different from Rob, how can I possibly have any kind of consistency and follow your data governance rules? So you may want to think about multiple levels of attributes. For example, one that the first level, the primary one that can be based on things that are consistent. So you may want to think in small appliances, small versus large could apply as well as applying to Deanna's apparel. When you think of a KitchenAid mixer, they've got the four quart and then they've got the big one. And you can get into more customized attributes later, but you need to think about things that are common because that helps you analyze the business. In other cases, brand is very important, like apparel in certain areas, Levi's versus Lee versus Wrangler may be important to Deanna. And for Rob, it may be KitchenAid versus or any other brands that are important to you, Small Electrics, GE, and whomever. So you need to think about those parts of the data attributes for consistency. So you can read the rest of these. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to us through social media. So feel free to reach out. We are absolutely happy to be friends on LinkedIn or any other way you want to cyber stalk us. I thought maybe we could turn our attention to, I guess it'll feel a little preachy, which I don't want it to feel, but maybe if the three of us gave the couple of things that we've seen as lessons learned, whether it's things I would recommend people never do, or these are the things that always work, really help move the needle in this area, or a combination of both, I think the group might benefit from maybe hearing some of that. We also, I do see a question, what's a good strategy for developing consistency and alignment when we have such different businesses within our company? And maybe I'll toss that back to Heidi because that's really coming off of what you were just talking about. One of the things that I mentioned was that trying to find on a primary level, what are the consistencies that you do have? Even if one person is looking at grocery and somebody else is looking at automotive parts, are there any consistencies you do have? Uh, and that just helps in reporting analytics and also it'll help you in search terms when you're looking at e-commerce that if somebody wants a large something, make sure it's consistently stated as large as a concept or an attribute so they can find the large dishwasher or the large t-shirt. Um, a secondary piece is to start narrowing it down a little bit more to things that are important to your line of business, such as is it brand? Is it other some other characteristic uh, such as flavor or scent? So those kinds of things, flavor and scent, they don't really apply to appliances necessarily, but they could be very important to the side on, on food and beverage. And once you get past those unique ones is take it even further and deeper. Where you may have had some of those common ones like color at a top level saying, my KitchenAid is blue, my dishwasher is red, uh, my pants are orange please don't wear orange pants, but you know, you have those three. You may go down to a further level where KitchenAid may have a mixer. They have colors that are seasonal and only available for a limited time. So they may have a standard blue one, but all of a sudden they come out with ice blue. So you need to have that designation while they're both in the blue parent. One stays blue and another becomes ice blue for more um, distinct features. I think sometimes people get hung up on what should be in, we, we keep using product examples, but we'll stick with that for a minute. What should be in my product hierarchy versus what should be a product attribute? And so I think that's something we should talk about just for a moment. The hierarchy should be persistent year after year after year. I should be able to look at, again, I'm just going to use a product example, a department and not question, well, what did that department mean three years ago? What will that department mean five years from now? Now, in some businesses, the level of innovation absolutely will change the items that belong to that department. But the fact that there's a department called blenders shouldn't be up for debate. There's, there's a good, good case to be made that blenders have existed for 100 plus years, I think. And they're going to likely exist or something that meets that need that I think will probably still be called a blender for a period of time in the future. That's a good way of sort of testing whether your hierarchy has the legs it needs. Is it persistent year over year? Attributes are meant to fill the gaps in for all that stuff that's not persistent, for all the things that are constantly changing. 
So that, there could be gajillions of examples of that. Uh, Heidi just had a couple of really good ones, again, sticking with the kitchen appliances, things that are special edition, things that are associated with a KitchenAid heritage anniversary and the products available then that are only going to be available that one year. They're not going to be available again because that's their 50, 100 year anniversary. That's, that's another thing to think about. And I don't think we had talked about that yet. That's a great point though, because one of the things you might notice if you don't characterize products with that kind of label or even locations with those kinds of distinctions where you have Cinco de Mayo may impact one store different than another. But when you look year over year on sales, if you don't have a way of identifying why all of a sudden did the mixers, their hand mixers go crazy on our sales last year. If you can't find out that, oh, it was that special edition, limited edition scarcity, you may have a hard time trying to justify to your management team what happened last year, this year. Yeah, the only the only other point I'll add to this too is the cleaner your hierarchies, the easier it is to do a reclassification, which all of our retailers love to do reclassifications of, of product and such within their hierarchy. So uh, even in the location hierarchy where you're moving things around from region to, to district and things like that, um, the cleaner the hierarchy, the easier it is to facilitate those, those reclasses. And that takes us back a little bit to Deanna's initial question about lessons learned yeah. uh, in our past. And so Rob, have you experienced any challenges or issues in your past or with clients on, okay, how frequently can we reclass? And what do we do if something didn't work? How, do you have anything you'd like to share with that? Yeah, certainly the reclass typically would be a one year or an annual type event uh, for most retailers, but some have attempted to, to want to do it more frequently. And the general idea behind it is, you know, they feel it's the better way to, to manage their product and, and, and organize their business. That's not a slam. It's, it's if the data was already clean, they could get to the same type of information uh, through reporting in other ways without necessarily having to do a true reclass unless it's an organizational um, dependency upon doing it. So, yeah, it, 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 uh, it, it can create quite the havoc if it's done more frequently because then you run into issues of, of like product year over year and, and historical sales and things of that nature and having to move and, and go with uh, the product into its new home and the hierarchy. Heidi, you want to give us some of your lessons learned or never do this type of advice? Well, one of the lessons learned, this was on a recent, at a recent project, was having to do with how long do you keep the data? The one answer we got from someone was until we run out of space, which may not be the right answer. So keeping data around just because you can doesn't mean that it's the most efficient use of resources especially if you're considering moving from a legacy environment to a cloud environment where the price is going to have a variance based on the size of your data potentially or the number of users or however they calculate the price, you may need to start coming up with some kind of data governance for purging, archiving the data so you can still get to it if you need to, but it's not part of your everyday needs. And I think my answer to my own question would be, to do this well, it can never, we touched on this earlier, it can never just be an IT thing or just a business thing. And, and I'm saying thing because this ends up being about process, behaviors, authority, tools. It can't just be one or the other. To do this well and to do it consistently year after year, it's got to be via a partnership where both the business and the technology teams feel heard and understood because they both come to this table, particularly with very good intentions that are often maybe aggressively <laughs> contradictory to each other, but all with the best of intentions. So to see each other and find a way through that, it, what I have seen work well is that you bring those tables together and say, we're going to fix this as an us, not an us versus them. We're not going to do it that way anymore. We're, we're incented to figure this out together and we will sink or swim together as we do so. And there's a whole bunch of change management and other tools and our toolkit as a firm that we bring to bear in transformations like that. But that is what I would answer my own question with. I see another question. Can you talk about ways to justify the expense of implementing a data governance approach? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> 
um, this is one of the, the things I was thinking of when I used the phrase political earlier, that often that's exactly where the rub is, that nobody wants to pay for this. And Heidi used the phrase earlier that it's, it's not sexy, but to, in today's retailing, and unfortunately, it's, it's, it's often as black and white as if you do not bite the bullet and pay to clean this up in a persistent and consistent way, you will not be able to keep up with your competitors because they'll be able to take advantage of technologies and capabilities you will not be able to take advantage of because your data won't enable it. That was my answer. I would love to hear Heidi and Rob's answers as well. I would say we have two clients who are working on 20 plus year old legacy mainframes. And they're in the same boat where there's not a fancy business case where you can do numbers and saying my sales will increase this much percent, my margin will improve, my inventory will reduce simply by moving from one platform to another or making sure that my data structure is proper and that all the data is characterized and flagged appropriately. It's hard to manage, but like Deanna said, do you, do you really think that a multi-billion dollar business can be running on a 20-year-old legacy system? Can a multi-billion dollar business not be able to find basic attributes and basic products because data is siloed or separated? And yeah, and to build on, on that point, usually most retailers are forced into doing some sort of data cleansing or governance activity when they're transitioning to a new system, specifically a merchandising system or an ERP, where the hierarchies are, are, are being um, relied upon heavily. Typically, there's a return on investment analysis and study that's done. You know, if I make you know this much investment, I'm going to get this much return. If there aren't proper data cleansing and governance structures put in place and the data is not clean, your ability to get that return on investment is a severely limited. Um, and that's one of the things that I would I would argue to justify the cost of doing such um, such an activity within an organization is to get those uh, returns on investment. Yeah. I'll harken back and state myself here very quickly. Um, I heard very similar pushback when e-com first hit this industry. A lot of really valid, um, but but it, certainly in retrospect, especially quite unfortunate thinking that sounded like, why would I invest in that? e comp's just going to cause more returns. It's just going to steal sales from my stores, et cetera. Um, I would say that the infusion of advanced analytics, so AI, ML, et cetera, sometimes just predictive pricing, which is kind of low tech nowadays, that be being obstructed, obstructed from being able to take advantage of that feels to me today in the industry as as painful as being obstructed from being able to launch an e-com site felt 30 years ago, 25 years ago. I, mean, I don't know. I'm feeling, I'm feeling <laughs> even older and older as I'm telling you my answer. <laughs> it goes back to that seasoned retail expert. <laughs> <seen us. laughs> yeah. Suddenly it's feeling like Friday. I don't know how it's only Thursday. Deanna, I'm with you. I was back when all of our work was done on big accounting paper and we didn't even have computers. So I'm with you on how long we've been there. So also thinking not just about e-commerce, but thinking about the future world and what we would need to support that. Because um, one of my relatives, friends has been doing virtual modeling on people. So you can have them sit in a booth, you get their full specs, uh, and then you can put garments on their avatar to see is it going to fit them or not. So if you don't know, have the precise dimensions of a product to be able to do that, if you can't support virtual worlds or virtual realities because your data isn't clean, you don't have that precision in there, it's an extension of e-commerce, taking it to another level of what it means if you don't have it, you're not staying competitive, you're going to increase your returns because your information wasn't accurate, your social information, your social um, ranking may plummet because all of a sudden that one guy on Yelp or that one woman on Twitter said, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. So it, it's not just the way that we've done it in the past, but considerations for future growth. It's not just what we fix for today, but what we need to be able to keep up going forward. Yeah. It's still always a tough sell from an expense perspective. There's no doubt about it. We're not trying to make mm -hmm. light of the heavy lift that can be with different leadership groups and different boards. That's absolutely a valid um, headwind. 
I see a new question, and Rob, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, I'd love for you to tackle that one. Not at all. In fact, that's one of the the, the main topics that that interest me in in all of this is you know how do you account for the time that's required in a project plan, especially if you're doing a new implementation of a of a point solution or an ERP of some sort. Um, generally speaking, it, it will vary. <laughs> I'm going to give a consulting answer. The, there are many factors that are going to that are going to come into play here. First of all, where where is the data located? Is it across multiple systems? Are you going to have to do a lot of transition and extraction and, and and transformation of that data? And two, do you have a strategy? Do you know what you want to do with it once you get it? And then uh, just based on the volume of the data and how long it will take uh, to, to manipulate it, uh, that will help guide you into coming up with an appropriate amount of time to put into your project plan. But uh, I cannot stress enough um, at the beginning of uh, an implementation cycle, even even as part of just the overall, you know, we're going to do this in a 18 month to 24 month time frame. Don't forget about looking at the data and doing the data migration and uh, cleansing aspect of it as part of your overall timeline. You'll thank yourself uh, later for doing it early. I, th I think Rob really stated it very well um, because he's a the project manager on a program where we have that in consideration for before we go live on a major transformation. Um, one of the things I like to ask both of you guys, sorry to put you on the spot, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, we've been talking a lot about the challenges, the negativity, the hardships um, this of doing this. Have you guys seen anywhere or any leading practices where people have either begun on the path or have gotten farther down the path that you want to share? Let's do some good stuff. I can give you an example. Unfortunately, it's from um, not too recently, but a a, I want to be careful and not not out who the client was with my answer here, but a, a client that was transitioning very intentionally from being focused on really one selling channel to um, being capable of selling across many channels, including wholesale. So moving also from just being a retailer to selling business to business as well. And and that that required a, a, a significant change in the way they thought about their data, things like dimensions, Heidi's example earlier. That wasn't something I had cared about ever before. But now if they were selling business to business, it suddenly was. You know, just that kind of stuff does get lost in the shuffle often. And not only did the team that tackled that project end up making huge strides and they, they, they did everything that their project plan to Rob's answer asked of them, many of the team members there got promoted as well. As soon as that project shut down and it, it didn't shut down, to their credit, they recognized that team needed to impanel a group and a process that would keep it going from there forward. And it wouldn't just be one and done. It wouldn't just be, let's do it now so we could launch our business to business. And then we won't have to think about this before. Part of what they put in place was a, a captain and team members underneath that captain who would do it from there forward. But their leadership got them so much visibility that a number of people from that, they called it a SWAT team, got promoted back in their normal business job. So I think that's a great example as well to stretch yourself as a career and really take on the challenge and the political and the expense and the stickiness of a topic like this and put yourself often in the bullseye of a lot of competing opinions sometimes you can pay really amazing career dividends as well not just business and data dividends so that's my answer i, I agree 100 percent with with that assessment and i'm going to take a portion of that and build upon it the uh, situation you you described had really good executive level support. Basically, they were championed uh, at the highest levels to do what they were doing. One of the most recent clients I've worked with had a similar scenario where they're looking to become a leading platform company. So they want to acquire other businesses and bring them in under their umbrella and and take their product having consistency among their product is extremely important and their ceo and leadership team have made that a, a, a pressing priority for them and that has given it momentum to succeed and i think that's really important across the board in any of these situations to have that executive buy-in and that push to make it a reality great great question heidi thank you for bringing us back to all the cool stuff that can happen as a result of these efforts as well that was a great question all right i'm going to turn us back to our audience and see if there are any other questions 
there. I'd like to try to answer my own question, if you Go don't ahead. mind. Yeah. One of the things I think we noticed, and we kind of forgot about maybe a little bit because we wanted to put it behind us, um, is the impact that COVID had on mm -hmm. the importance of data accuracy and data management, because all of a sudden the world shuts down and retailers still have to figure out how to operate and make money. Um, so some of the good things I saw was worth, okay, maybe it was like duct tape and bubble gum to make it happen, but figuring out really quickly how to be able to support buy online, pick up in store, or even call store pick up on the curb, which requires an enormous level of data accuracy of your inventory. And so that means everybody who is drawing from that inventory needs to make sure it's properly and as near real time as possible updated. Other companies, this goes back to the e-commerce point, is some companies who refused recently to do e-commerce all of a sudden realized, hey, um, yeah, so my stores aren't open. I got to sell. So let's just whip up an e-commerce channel and see how that goes. And their entire business process where they had been managing their inventory by pallets, all of a sudden they had to manage and distribute by eaches. So a lot of people, though COVID sucked in a lot of ways, it also provided folks abilities they had not thought were important before or had not prioritized as part of their roadmap to be able to make sure that their businesses could be nimble to support customers in the way that we've been saying, when they want, how they want, and wherever they want. So that's my good news. That's a great example. Yeah, again, we, we put out quite a lot of content about a lot of things that we as a firm learned, that the industry learned on the fly, thanks to COVID. <laughs> yep. All right, I see another question. What's your advice on how to transition to more collaborative data ownership? Our organization historically had IT ownership of data management. We realized the business ops need to be more involved in managing data. Well, I think I'll start by saying um, Rob actually gave probably the best answer tonight that it has to start from the top. It has to start with executive leadership and permission for the business to be involved and an encouragement through incentives that get IT to not just accept that involvement, but welcome and embrace that involvement. And, and it does take both teams really understanding each other in a way they may never have before. So the business partners that come to that table need to be okay with being told no. <laughs> and the IT team <laughs> that comes to that table similarly needs to be ready to be told, I know that sounds hard, but we got to figure it out. We, we just have to, our business needs that now. We have to figure that out. And, and that's not a comfortable place to be. You echoed exactly my, my thoughts to the question as well. Yeah, pretty please is not enough. <laughs> pretty please isn't enough, but there's a, there's a lot of ways of incenting both sides of that partnership to want to understand and support each other. And that's not just in this topic, that's in almost any technology delivery project. I would just reinforce and support what you said is that it's got to come from the tops down because one of the worst things that could happen, and again, this isn't on the good news track, but you have IT saying, I can't do that because that's not the way it should be done because I know better and I do all the tinkering and the coding. And then the business people saying, that's not good enough. I have to have it this way, even though it doesn't make any sense because all of a sudden gold equals silver, silver equals gold. So the good news is you can find that collaborative notion if you set up a data governance strategy in the first place to be able to have those conversations about what is the proper way to do things so that way everybody knows their role and they can work in a collaborative manner. So thank you, Deanna, for starting that topic. Like like so many of these great questions we're getting, these these aren't easy answers and they're not easy to execute. They're just not, unfortunately. That's why a topic like this needs to be discussed on a Thursday afternoon with some alcohol or whatever everyone may be drinking. So this is a hard one. It is. We are at the end of our time then. Um, again, we thank everyone so much for joining us. This is a format that we as a firm are learning to use and we find really helpful and it's very collaborative and interactive as tonight was. So we thank you for that as well. There are a few items for you to download. You can find all of that at our website. And again, we'll follow up with an email to help you get access to that and more. But for now, we'll bid you all cheers and a happy and safe, very safe 
4th of July holiday. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. That's a wrap for this episode of Talk Retail to Me. If you have questions related to today's topic, please visit our website at parkeravery.com to learn more and to contact us. Also, we'd love it if you shared Talk Retail to Me with any of your colleagues. It's streaming on all the major podcast platforms and the videos are available on our YouTube channel. For more Parker Avery industry expertise and advice, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.